Hey everyone, my name is Mike Cook. I'm a senior lecturer at King's College London in the Department of Informatics, and this is a talk I gave at Queen Mary in February of 2024 uh, called Anything Not Saved. Um, it was given at their Open Science Workshop, um, and it's about the stories that we tell, not just about scientists, but about researchers in general um, of all kinds. So I'm an AI researcher. I specialize in creativity um, and games, generative systems, um, generative AI sometimes. Uh, and I mainly build AI systems that work in, in game design. So I built a couple of systems like Angelina and Puck that design games on their own. Um, and I'm really interested in how AI can help us be more creative. Um, and how by modeling creativity through AI, we can also kind of think about what it means to be creative and, and what aspects of creativity matter to us. Um, and I also make things in my spare time. I, I make games, I make weird digital art, um, I do crochet, um, and we're going to get into some of that in a little bit as well and, and why that matters. So I gave this talk to a room full of people, some of whom I knew and some of whom I didn't, um, and I was thinking, you know, what would be the best way to kind of introduce myself to the people listening um, and to you watching today? Um, and it kind of depends on what person you are, right? It depends on what kind of things you're interested in. So you might think about me by looking at my Google Scholar page and seeing papers that I've published. Um, so these are some papers that I published during my PhD. Um, and for lots of people, that might be kind of how they understand me. If they want to know who I am and what I'm about, um, they might look at the kinds of papers that I wrote and the things I discussed. Um, other people, maybe members of the public or game developers, um, they might know me through press coverage. So I've been really lucky. I managed to get um, covered in the press uh, a few times in my career. These are some pieces that were also written during my PhD. Um, and this gives a different perspective on me. It gives the perspective through the lens of a journalist who's maybe trying to tell a story about the future or trying to profile a person or something like that. Some people, um, when I meet them, tell me uh, that they follow me on Twitter, which is always um, a terrifying thing to be told because I tweet nonsense, it turns out. And I thought for this talk, I would go and look at what my kind of most cited tweets were, as it were. Um, and you can see they're kind of goofy um, or about weird things. Um, and so if you were trying to learn who I am through my tweets, as many people do, many people only know me through Twitter, maybe. Um, these are the kinds of things that you would know about me. This is the kind of picture of me that you'd get, a very different picture maybe to um, the person that publishes papers at conferences. And for some people, if you know me through game development communities, um, you might know me through the games that I release. In fact, there might be some people who only know me through that means. Um, there's a game here called Dog Force that I made when I was writing up my PhD, um, or a game like Rogue Process that I worked on for years and years um, and then unfortunately cancelled. Um, after a long period of, uh, of working on it. Um, so for some people, they're only going to see me through my engagement with, with games or creativity. So I asked the room kind of which one of these lists tells the story of, of me and my work the best. And of course, you know, it's a very uh, weighted question because really none of the lists do, right? Um, and even if we combined all of these lists together, we might still not get the full picture of, of who this person is um, and why they do the things they do or, or what they're going to do next or why they didn't do something else. And, you know, there's loads of things which are not covered even by all of those lists. Um, so, for example, uh, my PhD project, which was to build an AI game designer called Angelina, um, it was previously worked on by someone called Mark Hull. Um, who's actually one of the people that inspired me to do a PhD. When I was a first year undergraduate, um, he gave an optional lunchtime lecture um, about making games as a way to teach people Java programming. Um, and I thought he was really cool and the stuff that he did was really cool. Um, and that was why I ended up doing a PhD. Um, and he left to become um, a programmer and uh, was one of the people that kind of uh, made Frontier Developments what it is today is, is my understanding of it. Um, they were a very, very small development studio at one point. They'd lost a lot of people. Um, Mark joined just as they were working on uh, Elite Dangerous. Um, and, you know, he's an incredibly intelligent and smart uh, engineer and programmer um, and did incredible things on that game. Um, I got banned from Twitch in 2014. So um, me and some colleagues of mine had set up a workshop called Exag. You can see a screenshot of this on the right, a screenshot of the stream, in fact. Um, and we wanted it to be accessible to everyone, so we kind of broke conference re regulations um, and streamed it online, um, which was also, it turns out, breaking Twitch regulations, because in 2014, Twitch only allowed broadcasting um, like games, basically. Um, of course, nowadays, you can watch people have their lunch on Twitch, um, but back then you couldn't, and we got banned within a few hours of going live. Um, 
I did almost all of my PhD work, including writing my thesis and all of those papers that you mentioned uh, earlier, that you saw earlier, and all of the games I mentioned as well. All of that work was done in a Starbucks in South London, um, and I still walk past that Starbucks every day. Uh, I used to call it my office. Um, and the press things that I talked about, like a huge portion of that comes down to a very unlikely chain of events, um, where a friend of mine was uh, taking a master's in science communication at Imperial. He wanted to pitch an article to a magazine um, for the games industry, um, and he thought that my PhD sounded interesting, and we sat down in the canteen and had a chat about it. Um, and that article led to a New Scientist article, which led to many other articles. Um, and uh, that guy, Will Haven, is now um, a very successful science journalist at MIT Tech Review um, and a really lovely person. But, you know, if he hadn't taken an interest in my work, I might not be writing this talk today as a senior lecturer. I might not even be in academia at all. And this doesn't even get into the stuff that I do in my spare time, like crocheting tiny animals or, or doing pixel art. And these things are important, right? They also have had an impact on my thinking about creativity or my thinking about games. Um, they just have an impact on my life and how happy I am as well, right? So all of these things are kind of important. They all play into um, the life that I lead as a researcher and a scientist. And I think they help us make sense of those people that do this work. So at this point in the talk, I put this person's photo up and I asked if anyone in the room knew who it was. And I wasn't really sure. I mean, I didn't really know who was going to be in the room. Um, I knew there was a, a colleague of mine, Simon Lucas, who I thought maybe might know. Um, he had a look on his face that made me think that maybe, maybe he was getting there. Um, but in the end, I told everyone that this was a person called Christopher Strakey. Um, and I don't know if you've heard of him before, but if you have, it's probably because um, he was a very famous uh, computer scientist, made a lot of contributions to the theory of programming languages and software engineering, um, worked with uh, a real who's who of 20th century scientists, including Turing, Penrose, Landon, Milner, um, and uh, developed the notion of time sharing, which was hugely influential on 20th century computing. He was also involved in the construction of the Manchester Mark I, which is one of the first like big computers that we had access to in the UK. So he's got a nice Wikipedia page that lists all of this stuff. Really interesting guy. He also did some other really interesting stuff, which is not discussed as often, um, like on his Wikipedia page. So in 1952, when he was working on the Manchester Mark I, he implemented um, a program to play checkers. And this program actually displayed the state of the game uh, on a screen. Um, and this is possibly the first time that a computer had ever done this. Uh, lots of, well, not lots, some people had, had put, um, built machines that could play games like tic-tac-toe, um, but it's thought that this is one of, if not the first um, computer program that actually displayed the state of the game, which some people uh, call the first video game as a result of this. Also in 1952, and also on the Manchester Mark I, he wrote a program to generate love letters using a text grammar. Um, and although there had been machines to generate words in, in the past, um, as in machines, not computers, um, this is, we think, like the first example of a computer program that, that generated literature, um, certainly one of the first. So these are two like fairly significant things um, that Strachey did basically in his spare time in 1952 while building this computer to do actual research as he saw it. And what's really incredible is that we can actually see the source code and his handwritten notes about this love letter generator um, still today. This is in the Bodleian Archive in Oxford. Um, I was taken here by uh, Professor Ursula Martin, who wanted to show it to me. And it's really astonishing. It's a really astonishing thing to see. Um, we can see his handwritten text grammar that constructed these love letters. Um, and what really strikes me about it is that this could almost have been written today. This looks like a Twitter bot. This looks like something made on cheap bots done quick. Um, and yet, Christopher was one of the first people thinking about language in this way um, and writing computers um, to, to process it. It's also really interesting to know that Christopher was gay, not openly gay, um, but certainly uh, open among close friends, um, which makes us think maybe in a different way about this love letter work. Um, and we also know that he was friends with Turing at the time that he wrote it, and that Turing found the love letter generator very funny as well. Like they both kind of found it funny. Um, they did it as a joke. Um, he was also descended from aristocracy, um, and he's got some interesting writing where he's kind of sexist and classist as well. Um, so there's a, a section here that was sent to me also by uh, Professor Martin, um, where he says that, you know, computers might put a lot of people out of jobs, but lots of those people are going to be like young women working as secretaries, and they were probably going to get married and have kids and, and quit their jobs after a couple of years anyway, so it's not a big problem. 
Um, so it's, you know, this is, again, interesting context for this person that, that worked on all of these interesting technologies and had these interesting side projects. Like, um, and it kind of leads us to ask where, you know, which ones of the, which bits of these things are relevant to Strachey's life as a computer scientist and which ones aren't. And I'd argue that, that all of it's relevant um, and that all of it helps us understand who Strachey was as a person. And maybe his invention of time sharing is not related to his desire to play checkers with a computer, but I think there are threads. There are threads that connect these things together. So I didn't ask the room who this person is, um, not because everyone should automatically know, but I, I knew that some people would. So this is Alan Turing, um, widely regarded as, as one of the first computer scientists, if not you know, the person that invented the concept of a computer scientist. Um, and uh, in 1952, so very, very close to his death, um, Turing wrote and published a paper about how he thought certain types of patterns formed in nature. Uh, Turing wasn't a biologist, obviously he knew some biology, um, but really the paper was a mathematical paper. It was about um, a possible way that a system could work in which chemicals could kind of play against each other to create these regular patterns. Um, Turing didn't really know whether this was true or not. It was a, a theory. Um, but uh, decades later, it was experimentally proven, and we now call these things Turing patterns, and they create effects like this um, in nature. So this was a complete side project for Turing. This didn't have anything to do with his work on computing or artificial intelligence or anything else. Um, and yet uh, it was enough to be recorded and picked up and proven later on and is now named after him, which I think is pretty cool. The last person I introduced is, is this person here. This is Ada Lovelace, um, an incredibly influential programmer and mathematician, worked with Charles Babbage on the analytical engine um, and uh, essentially foresaw lots of the implications that the analytical engine had um, and was able to do a lot of theoretical work that went beyond that machine's capabilities. So in the 1840s, uh, Babbage had been lecturing about the analytical engine, um, and this Italian engineer had seen these lectures um, and had gone and written papers about them in Italian. Um, and Ada was really excited about this and wanted to translate these uh, essays so that he, she could share them with Babbage and kind of discuss their contents. So she translates them herself into English from Italian, um, but while she's translating it, she's adding her own notes. She's adding translators' notes as like footnotes or afterwords um, to share with Babbage, but also for her own sake as well. They, they feel a bit like someone live tweeting a conference talk. And these notes are almost as long as the original essay. I mean, they're big. Um, and they include lots of the really famous quotes that we attribute to her. So, you know, lots of the quotes about um, that, that have got fed into what's called the Lovelace test um, or pe her discussing creativity, um, they don't come from, you know, separate things that she was writing. They come from this translation of someone else's essay um, that she was doing because she was excited about it. Um, so I think this is really interesting as well, because this is, this is not um, a standard part of her life. This was something else that she was doing on the side, right? And I think um, it's tempting to think about research as a series of eureka moments by lone geniuses, um, but all of these landmark things, they only really tell us uh, a small part of the story of what is happening in a field um, or even across the whole of humanity. Um, and without these records of these other things, of people's little obsessions or side projects or um, speculation or, or you know things that they did for themselves to take notes, um, we'd lose so much knowledge and information about... Um, uh, about the, the field and the work that they did. So at this point in the talk, I kind of put forward some goals. Um, and because I'm not on a timer, I can add a bit of context to this. So the illustration for this slide, by the way, is a friend of mine, uh, Miriam Aladhari. We were at Dagstuhl, which is a computer science retreat um, in the mid 2010s. Um, and for one of our projects, we decided to prototype a game that used AI as a game mechanic. Uh, Miriam is not only a computer scientist and a game designer, but also an incredible artist. So while um, some of the group were implementing the basic framework that we'd come up with, Miriam gets out her watercolors and sketches these original um, uh, artworks that we ended up using in the game. We took photos of them. Um, and I knew it was a moment that I was going to want to remember. Um, and so I took photos of her doing the watercolors um, and I can now share them with you today. So the goal slide that, uh, that I wanted to talk about the record of our field is currently based on things that we are incentivized to create as part of our jobs. So that's things like papers, maybe releasing code open source, maybe arguably press articles because we're incentivized to create impact. Um, and even if you maybe you don't work for a university, maybe, for example, you're a game developer watching this. Um, what are the things that you're incentivized to do? 
Well, you're incentivized to release your game, obviously. Um, maybe to give a talk at GDC talking about one of your techniques. But that's it. Like, you know, we're only incentivized to create certain types of records about what we do. And that's not necessarily the best way for us to tell the story of, of the work, right? So we need to find more ways to record and more importantly preserve the records of um, these other parts of our lives. And for some fields, this is kind of urgent. So um, I work in a field called automated game design. Um, this field is only about 20 years old. Um, there is one, one work that was done in the early 90s, but most of the work's been done in the last 20 years. Um, and some of those systems that were built 15 to 20 years ago um, are unrecoverable. Um, the code doesn't work, the games don't work, um, there are no videos of the games being played. There might be one or two screenshots in a paper, um, but largely speaking, those systems are dead. We can still go into a museum and see Christopher Strachey's love letter generator, um, but these systems are, are dead and gone. Um, and that's become more and more uh, kind of, I've become more and more aware of this recently, um, particularly when working with a student of mine who I'll mention in a couple of slides, uh, Florence Smith-Nichols, who um, has a background in archaeology and has brought a lot of that work um, to their PhD studies. And thinking about how archiving uh, becomes important and how records of the past become important and how we build those records um, suddenly makes you realize how fragile the existing records you have of even things that happened a few years ago. But there are other challenges as well. Um, academic systems don't reward any of this work. So even things like open sourcing your source code for a project is not really rewarded. There are some places that will acknowledge it, but it's not rewarded in the same way that, say, getting a paper at a big conference is rewarded. At the same time, if we decided to change systems so that it was rewarded, um, that could also be bad um, because that might punish people that weren't able to record things, that didn't feel comfortable sharing things. So we don't want it to become the center of our jobs. It's just that we want it to become a thing that people do feel they can do and are supported in doing. We also need to be aware that the infrastructure around us is crumbling. So. We think about preservation in a particular way. We think that it's possible to um, you know, just put something in Dropbox or upload something to Imager or put something on our personal websites, but these things disappear all the time. And I think lots of us don't realize how temporary lots of these solutions are. Um, a lot of my institutional email addresses that are on paper, well, they're, they're not because I didn't put them, but um, let's say my colleagues who worked at the same institutions, their email addresses are on papers they wrote, but the day they left those institutions, those email addresses stopped working. And some universities don't even allow you to forward emails to new addresses. So, you know, this whole infrastructure is extremely fragile. Um, again, since I'm not on a timer, I can tell you that this photo was taken at Banff in, I believe, 2016. This was uh, another retreat with uh, a bunch of researchers. Um, and it's lovely to look at some of these photos and think about where lots of these people are now. Um, but they also have their own problems. I mean, this is a personal memory for me, which is why I've included it. But we'll get to that in a couple of slides. So what would I like to do? What, what, are, what are the kind of the solutions as I see it to some of these problems? Um, well, yeah, okay, good. Um, so, sorry, I had to double check my slides are in the right order there. Um, so one example that I gave in the talk was um, the Reflections Tracker FDG. So FDG is the Foundations of Digital Games Conference. It's a, it's a games research conference. Um, and uh, in the past, we talked about doing what I referred to as a failure track, um, which is you know, a track for publications for, for things that didn't work out. Um, wisely, uh, the organizers decided not to call it that. Um, and one day they asked me if um, I wanted to help chair the reflections track. Um, and the way that they phrased it was um, postmortems and analyses of experimental work that did not go according to plan. Um, and the nice thing about this track is it kind of subverts the existing academic system. So the way that the academic system works is for various reasons, you may need to get publications, peer-reviewed publications, that show that your work was accepted um, by the community. Unfortunately, most of those systems only allow you to submit work that was successful. But if we create a track explicitly about work that wasn't successful, we allow you to get the things that peer-reviewed publications give you, which is you know, recognition in your own university, for example, um, through writing about work that you would not normally be able to. So I think this is a really interesting example of how an academic process can be subverted to actually help um, you know, one of these goals. The track was very small, and unfortunately I, I don't think it was repeated, um, but it is a really good thing, and the, the papers that came out of it were great. Uh, this Challenging Systems of Play paper, for example, was uh, an incredible reflection on an attempt to uh, do game design um, surround on trans issues. Um, this paper at the bottom was by uh, Thomas, uh, just a, a starting student who had had 
um, a difficult time with a project and was able to share it and get feedback and, and talk about why it was difficult, which was really, really important. Um, so both of those papers were, were really, really wonderful endorsements. So more tracks like this, I think, is a really good way forwards. We also need to be taught what archiving is and how to record things. So archival work is an entire field of, of study and, and development in itself. It's changing all the time in response to new things that need to be archived. Um, and most of us don't know anything about it. Like, I don't know anything about archival work. Um, and the only reason I do know a little bit is because one of my students, Florence, ended up working for the British Library um, for several months on a project um, looking at how to archive certain video games. And this included video games that were no longer playable um, because their source code, um, they were no longer downloadable on, on certain app stores. Um, video games that were in VR, which raised questions of how you should capture this experience. Um, video games that hadn't been released yet in some cases. Um, and there's a whole report that you can read online about this process. Um, so we need to find ways to kind of learn from these people, from these organizations that are publishing about how they archive work and what they think about building long-term archives, archives that last for centuries, um, and using that knowledge to bring back into our own fields and to think about, for example, how to archive an automated game designer. I also think that we can build archival work into um, the UKRI funding process. So when we write grants, we already have to write something called a responsible research and innovation statement. Um, and this is for things like uh, sort of reassuring society that you are taking a responsible approach to work on, for example, AI, um, and that you're thinking about the ethical implications of your work. But I think we can also see kind of archival and record creation as part of this as well. Um, and that this should be um, kind of a part of that process, also because it allows us to audit and reflect on um, the whole process that led to a project being done. Um, and this is also something where um, Florence and I have been talking about this in the context of um, archaeology. Florence has been talking to me about how archaeologists are quite fastidious uh, record keepers. Um, and they do reflect on their own processes and work a lot. Um, and I think, again, this is something which we could take more into other fields. So building on that in our funding applications and actually recognizing that, yes, this work's valuable and you can talk to us about it and you can tell us that you're going to do it and we will recognize that as good work um, could be really important for our funding processes as well. The event talked a lot about open access, um, and open access is really important. It's part of you know, making science accessible, but we have to remember that open access only broadens access to the archive we already have. It doesn't actually broaden the archive itself. Um, and so uh, we need to encourage people to archive different types of things, not just papers, not just source code even, um, but also you know, screenshots, notes, journals, things that we might not think are as valuable. Um, this uh, list on the right hand side of the slide is a piece of paper I found while writing this talk. I wrote it over 10 years ago, um, and it was when I was coming towards the end of my PhD and I was reflecting on kind of restarting the Angelina project. What did I want to do with it? And it was just really fun to like look at this list and think about my motivations at that moment in time. Um, and these are these are the kinds of things I'd like to record more of. Nope, that, should, <laughs> that slide shouldn't be there. Um, so at this point, I, I asked the audience um, what these three people have in common. They have a lot of things in common, um, but two important things they have in common is that they're white um, and they're kind of famous. They're kind of already well known, right? Um, but, you know, academia is not a meritocracy. The reason I could tell stories about Strachey, about Turing, about Lovelace um, is because uh, that they are already famous. They're already people that have Wikipedia pages. So it's important that we care for everyone, that we care about everyone's stories. Um, otherwise, we're only going to remember people that the system is already elevating, um, which in many cases are people who, for example, are from richer backgrounds, are white, are male, um, are born in the West, are born speaking English, that kind of thing. Um, and you know, this notion of survivorship bias um, really does affect us in academia. And unfortunately, that survivorship bias is sometimes very literal, right? So um, in Gaza, every university has been destroyed in the last six months through bombing. Um, and that means that we have lost the stories that were taking place and that would have taken place in those institutions. Um, and unfortunately, I, I can't tell you if any games research was lost in that process because I'm ashamed to say I don't know if there was games research going on at any of those institutions. And so if we don't take the opportunity to tell these stories, um, they can be lost so easily forever. And it's not just about 
big stories. It's not just about whether groundbreaking stuff was happening somewhere. It's important that we record things that don't matter, things that seem irrelevant, things that seem boring, um, because that's what helps us understand uh, the time that we live in and the thing, the reasons why we did things. And in particular, something that we find is that um, we kind of don't record things that we take for granted, right? So we think that something is not worth recording, so it doesn't get recorded. Um, but then what we don't realize is that 100 years from now, the things that people thought were important, there's like loads of records of that. But the things that people thought were trivial, or uninteresting, actually no one bothered to record them at all. The records that, that were accidentally taken, you know, kind of just destroyed um, over time naturally. And so we end up not knowing about these trivial things, these things that seemed not to matter at the time, but actually were very important. Um, and often those are the small details that really tell us about the culture at the time or, or why things happened. So this was my concluding slide. Um, what we think of as research is actually just a side effect of what we do as researchers. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that you work at a university or that you're a lecturer or anything like that. Um, really, it covers a lot of our work. You know, um, Research papers and things like that, they're, they're just like checkpoints. They're, they're certain things that happen while we're doing this work. Um, and so we need to think more carefully about what actually is it that we're recording? What about the past? are we saying is relevant and important for the future to remember? Um, and the last point I ended on kind of is that I don't think that there's an easy way to find central solutions to this. I don't think conferences or universities or big organizations are gonna help us solve this problem. I think the best solution we can come up with is to constantly be creating a small archive around ourselves of us and the people around us. And everyone else is doing this as well and these archives overlap and connect and I really think that's the only chance we have of, of recording as much of our story as possible. Um, and I hope that people will continue to do that. Um, and some of those people are my students um, who are hopefully uh, continuing the stories that, that um, I started writing as well. And just as I continued my supervisor's story, I highly recommend looking up their work. Um, and if you want to see some of the things I've done, um, you can find that on my website or drop me an email or a tweet. Thanks so much for listening and uh, yeah, keep, uh, keep track of things.